morning, church. Welcome. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Come on, stand up with us, and let's sing some Christmas songs this morning. Amen. Come on, let's sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Lord, in excess Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why a joyous strains prolong? What the glad some tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song. To a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your 
suffer, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. That soul is moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels still in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. In the church of Christ was born, in the spirit of the plague, now this gospel truth. The world shall not fear, shall not fear. The love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Come on, church, let's praise the Father. the highest your day is the greatest your day stands above the moon all thrones and dominions all power and possessions your day stands above the moon and the angels cry oh creation cry oh 
you Jesus would you lift your hands to heaven and just praise Jesus in this moment thank you God for being so wonderful you're holy God your name is above all names God oh one day everybody's going to confess your name every tongue and every knee will bow before you God Lord we come before you and we want to do that before it's that moment God we want to praise your name we want to say your name we want to bow before you God we want to live for you, Jesus, and not for ourselves, not for this world, not for our sin. Father God, we want to live for you. We want to live for you. That's the best life we can ever have is to live for you, God. Hallelujah. In this spirit of prayer, if you would just keep your eyes closed, please. I want you to think about that need. I want to pray for everybody. We all want to pray for everybody, I believe. And if you know somebody who needs Jesus, or you are struggling with something, or you are sick, or the finances, or relationship, addiction, I don't know what it is. If you need prayer, you know, know somebody who needs Jesus in their lives, would you just lift one of your hands, and I want to pray for everybody in this room. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We lift our hands, Father God, for ourselves, many for others, Lord. We ask you, God, that you would just see, you see the hands, you see the lives, you see the minds, you know what we are thinking about, you know about who we are thinking. You know that you're the only one who can do a miracle. We cannot do a change of heart. We cannot change the health situation. We cannot change the relationship situation, God. We, don't, we cannot change this addiction problem, this sin problem. But you can do it, Holy Spirit. And we come before you. We lift our hands this morning for the people in our lives and ourselves, Father God. We ask you that your spirit will be moving, will be moving in people's lives, God. And before the, the end of this year, we'll see those family members come to you, Jesus. We keep praying, Father God. We keep praying for the salvation of the people in this town and the surrounding areas, Lord. We keep praying for the kids, the youth, the adults that come to this church. Lord, the many thousands in our area who do not have a relationship with you, Jesus. 
Lord, we bring you the family members. We bring you relationship. We bring you people in our lives that we know, God, that need you, Lord. We ask you for healing in physical bodies. We ask you for people in our church who are struggling with the health, who are sick, who couldn't make it to church today. We pray for everybody in our church that is sick, Father God, that is not doing good. We pray for every marriage in our church. We pray for everybody who is struggling in their walk with God, who is being deceived by the lies of their minds and the flesh, Father God. That we ask you that your spirit will just go into that, into that person's life, God, and you will just bring them to the obedience of Christ, Lord. We bring you all these needs, Father God, and we give you all the glory for the miracles that you are doing, for the things that you are doing, for the people that you are saving and transforming, for softening our hearts to you and to your word, Father God. We ask you, God, that you would help us to grow and mature, to be more like your son, Jesus. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen and amen and amen. Amen. Would you just leave your seat and say hello to somebody? Introduce yourself, hug somebody. Let's be very friendly this morning. Good morning. morning good morning it's beautiful it's warm in here i think it's 70 degrees outside i don't know what it is somebody told me it's going to go to the 50s 50 is good 50 is good i want to resurrect something only god can resurrect the dead but i think i can resurrect it hasn't died completely but we haven't talked about it many many years for many many years we used to do the third Sunday of the month, the building fund. You know, we talk about mission the first Sunday of every month. And I, the good news is that we bought the property next door. That is a blessing. We paid off all the two old mortgages. Yeah, you can give God a round of applause because <laughs> Jesus says, I am going to build my church. But you know, he's going to build our church through us. You know that, you know. And so God has been faithful. And what is the building fund offering? I'm going to be talking about that every third, probably I hope not forget. 
And what it is, is we give a special offering for the building fund. Now, you don't see no building getting up because until we don't pay the property, which has a 15-year mortgage plan, we make our monthly payment every month. But in 15 years, it's going to be too much for some of us to see a building getting up. I hope you are in heaven because if you are old especially, some people say, I don't want to live till 90. I understand that. I say, I would like to live till 90 if, still, if I feel like I'm 50 because 50 is the new 20, you know that. <laughs> and so what is the building fund? It's, uh, you go and you pray and you think, I give so much. We give our tithe. It's not your tithe. It's not your mission given. It's a special something you give every month. And 100% of that that is in the envelope says building fund will go 100% to additional mortgage payment every month. Is that easy to understand? If you ever bought something with payments, you know, you have four years or six years for the car, 30 for the house, 15 is our plan. I'd like to see our, how many of you guys would like to see us building in less than 15 years from now, you know, 15 years. But it really it depends on us. There's, there's people who has been doing that, a few for all these last 20 some years, um, but I am trying to bring it back. So think about it. It's a special given you do, you put building fund and all that goes to an additional payment. But I don't want to talk more about money. I might say a little bit more in my sermon, but next Sunday is Christmas. Amen. For us from South America, Christmas is the 24th. But I know in America is the 25th. You guys are always late for everything. But, well, it's just a joke. Some people like to do 24, 25th. But next Sunday is going to be our Christmas services. And how about we all bring somebody to our Christmas service? Does that sound like a good idea? Easy. Not your dogs and your cats. You know, not that. They are not going to accept Jesus. We need more invitation and people so 9 in the morning 10 30 in english those two services and 12 in spanish and the best thing i think next sunday is going to be our cute little kids doing this amazing christmas play and so next sunday bring somebody to church it's easy you know tell them you know if you want to be sarcastic like me i don't know if that's a good thing they say well what what did they sing last time you went to church and they say Holy night and say, oh, they're going to sing that song next Sunday again. I don't know if it's in the schedule. I may be lying. But so invite somebody to church. It's Christmas. It's easy to bring them. Amen. And some moms do this for Mother's Day. The only thing I want for Mother's Day is go to church with me. I tell you something. For many of you, maybe the best gift you can get from this person, this Christmas is for them to be in church, you know, more than another bag of whatever underwear or socks they buy you. It's better to bring them to church. Amen. Jesus is bigger than a Ferrari, way better than whatever it is. Let's go to the Bible today. And I'm looking at the clock because I am really excited about this sermon. And we're ending the year. I am the other day for pastor appreciation. Um, Portia made a shirt that says, not your average, not your average pastor. And so I'm not preaching about Christmas until next Sunday. If you want to hear a Christmas sermon, next Sunday. We are ending the year, and I want to talk to you, and the title of this message is Pats, Pats, P-A-T-H-S. The Bible has a lot to say about ways and paths in our lives. Psalm 25, 4 says, the psalmist asked God, show me your ways, O Lord. He's begging God, asking God to show him your ways, O Lord. Big Y, your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Let's pray, Father. I ask you that you will just take this service, continue to bless us as you are with your presence, your joy, your peace in this place, by which you please take us to your word this morning in a very particular and personal way. Lord, you know what we are all going through in our lives. 
And I ask you, God, that you would just please speak to us. Use things that I say or I don't say, Father God, to speak to people's life. And God, we give you all the glory for what you are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The Bible has many scriptures that you're going to find these two words in one verse. Ways, paths. Why not always paths? Why not always ways? Because in English and Spanish and in Hebrew, and I would believe in most of language, those two things are not the same. In the Hebrew, ways is translated ways in English. In the Hebrew, the word for path, somebody said, do you ask me this week, did you know the difference? I didn't even study because if I tell you the Hebrew word, you might even remember. But it's a two different words, very, very distinguished because they don't mean the same. A way, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. But in that way of salvation that you and me are walking, there are many paths. Do you have a relationship with a best friend? That's a path. Your marriage, that's a path. What you do with your money, that's a path. What you do with your schedule, that's a path. What you do with your kids, that's a path. What you do in the morning, that's a path. What you do in your mind, that's a path. What you do with your sexual inclinations or desire, that is a path. What you do when somebody treats you wrong or somebody does something you don't like, that's a path. Every single day of our lives, we have many paths decisions that we have to take a path is my walk from here to there a path is my walk from here to my house or my drive from here to my house a path is a short distance so in another word the way in the original hebrew is full of paths or in other words the way is made out of paths Following me here? So that's why Jesus, in his word here, because he is the word, he says, show me your ways. Other scriptures say just one way. Because God says to his people in the Old Testament, after he puts them in the first victory in the promises, you, I put before you two ways. The way of life and the way of death. The way of life is in my commandments, in my word. If you do what I say, you're going to be blessed. If you choose something away from my word, that's the path of or the way of death. So it is important that we understand why it says here ways. Because many in this room, I would say probably 100% of we in this room, we before we met Jesus, we only knew one way. And what was that? The way of sin. The way of self-destruction. The way of pleasing myself. The way of whatever Christian wants to do. You know what I'm talking about. Not a Christian. Christian my name. Maria, Johnny, whatever is your name. But there was a moment in our lives that the Holy Spirit came and showed us another way. And that was who? Jesus. And in that moment, you made the decision to surrender your life to him and to make him your identity. I'm going to go back on that word. That's why it says, show me your ways, the two ways. And then says what? Teach me your paths. God has two ways. The devil, didn't, is he, the devil will lead you into the path of into the way of death and destruction. Are you following me here? But the devil didn't. God gave us, gave, gave us the option. The two ways are made by God. You need to understand that. When the devil rebelled against God, God made the hell not for you and for me. He made hell for who? For the devil. But then he says, but I am going to let people also decide. If I'm going to be the Lord and the guide of their lives, or the devil, 
and they have to make a decision. Am I being clear here now? And so he leads me. That's why Jesus says, your father is not God. Your father is Satan. But now we are born again in Jesus. So we need to find ourselves at the end of this year looking at the paths that we are walking in. The Bible says in Proverbs, that's my first point, only one way of wisdom. That's my first point, only one way of wisdom. Proverbs 4, 11 says, I have taught you in the, in the way, not ways, in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. Because God knows that you and I have many paths. See how clear the Bible says? I have what? Taught you in the way of wisdom. What is the way of wisdom? The word of God. For everything that you and I face, everything, in this book, and this book is enough. You don't need another book, not the sister, not the brother, not another revelation, not a before, not an after. This is all the word of God. He taught us the way of wisdom, and then he says, he leads us after we know the word. He can lead us in the right path. Did you know why Christians struggle sometimes? They are saved. They go into heaven. But they still struggle in big time in one, two, or three paths of their lives. Because they have not seek the revelation of the word of God in that area of their lives. I hope what I say you can understand. You are not condemned. We're going to see it biblically. You are not condemned to feel, live full of fear, desperation, slavery of sin. You're not condemned. God, in his word, left the wisdom for us. The Bible says, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. The way of wisdom is only one. And the way of wisdom starts when I make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. And that's where my identity changes. If you ask me, who are you? And the first thing that comes out of my mouth is, I'm a grandpa. That's my identity. I think that the greatest thing that I can ever have in my life is being a grandpa. It's pretty great, but it's not the greatest. Let me tell you, Jesus is a lot greater than that. Who are you? I'm a pastor. <laughs> Jesus is way more than what I can do as a pastor. If you ask me, well, who are you? I'm a husband. If, I, if you tell me, who are you? I say, I'm a millionaire. First, I'm lying. But if money is my identity... I'm the CEO of whatever the company name is. Where is my identity? My identity is in what? Is in what? In da and not in Jesus. If you ask me, who are you? And I say, I am gay. Where is my identity? In my sexual gender desires and inclinations. Are you following me here? Now, when the Bible and the word of God becomes my identity, I can promise you when Jesus is my identity, that's the only way I'm going to have salvation, hope, peace, and joy in my life. Any other identity will never give me what Jesus can give me. So when you, I'm talking about identity here. When you tell me, I was born like that. Let me tell you, I was born a very horrible sinner too. I was born very selfish. Anybody can say amen to that if you identify with what I'm saying. I was born very prideful. I was born very self-centered. I was born with a spirit of controlling the situation and try to control others. 
my sexual orientation when I was born was very, very much ungodly. I was not 14, 15, 16, staying away from pornography and thinking, this is, I'm a Christian, my identity is in Christ, and all I want is one day to find a wife, marry her, and that's going to be my first sexual experience when I am in my honeymoon first night. That was not my born desire. Anybody here with me? I was a teenager, and if you were like me, I wanted to have a girlfriend, I wanted to kiss her, and I wanted to get whatever I could from that woman. Did you see how we are all born? Are you here with me? We are born a mess. That's why Jesus says, do not be surprised that I tell you, you need to be born where is my identity in who I was born the 7th of August of 1972 or is my identity who I was born again in Jesus? Every aspect of my life. In Romans, the Bible says that man who is of the flesh, he thinks in the thing of the flesh. And that one that is born by the Spirit... Big S, by the Holy Spirit, he thinks and meditates in the things of the Spirit. You and I decide as a Christian if my identity is going to be 100%. I am going to do what the Bible says about every aspect of my life. That's why I say my first point is the way of wisdom is where? Where is it? Where is it? Here. Every Christian in the world has to deny themselves to anything that is against the word of God. You know why? Because that's the only way to have a close relationship with Jesus. Not only to go to heaven, but that's the only way that you're going to have peace, and joy, and abundant life. Many people don't understand John 10.10 10 when it says, I bring you abundant life. Because the identity is not in every aspect of my life what the Bible says. Somebody does wrong to me, I want to kick them in the behind. See where my identity now is not the word of God anymore. Family, money, your job, whatever it is, every path should be established. John 3, I'll let you hang with the verse so you can Google it later. It says, that what is born of the flesh is flesh. But that what is born by the Spirit, big S, is what is Spirit. Were you born by the flesh many years ago? Everyone here. That what is of the flesh, born by the flesh, is flesh. That what is born by the Spirit, now my identity is what? Christ in Christ in Christ in Christ in Christ alone. Because, like I said, nothing of the other identities will ever give you nothing to compare with Jesus. But we struggle in many paths. So we make, my second point, many path decisions every day. Like I say in the Hebrew, these two words are very different, way and paths. The way is the purpose, is the vision, is the direction, is the general thing. I'm a Christian. That's the way that I choose. There is two ways, Jesus or not Jesus, life or death, light or darkness. The path is the specific steps that we take every single day. Big Aggie here. He's going to have to make decisions this week about many paths. Yeah. Your work, your relationship, your time with God, your finances, your health. All these paths. And then when it comes to relationship, we have most of us more than one relationship. 
and you say, how come I do good with these people, but I do not do good with these people? I wish all these people don't show up for Christmas dinner this year. You know what I'm saying? But when you're living in the Word of God, in that path of your life, you don't have to wish for something. You know that you're living in obedience in whatever happened in that area is permitted by God to bless you one way or the other. Can I say that again? When you're living in obedience, you will accept the will of God in that area because you know you're living in obedience. Jesus said, and he teaches for chapters and chapters and chapters, all these many, 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 many teachings, like 24 of them or so. And at the end he says, if you hear these words that I just teach you, all these 24 teachings, and if you hear what I just teach you and you do it, I will compare you to a man who built his house on the rock. But if you don't, you'll be like the man who builds the house on the sand. Falling apart is never a result of obedience to the word of God. It's always a result of disobedience. You're dealing with conflict. You know what the Bible says? Talk trash about that person. No, that's the way of the path of the identity of the, of the world, of the flesh, of the pride, of the selfishness. You're dealing with conflict. The Bible says in Matthew 14, you go and you talk one on one with that person. That's the first thing you do. How many people in the paths of the relationship do not do that? Have you found yourself talking trash about somebody ever? That's a path. Many of us have to make that decision every day. Dealing with relationships. This morning, man, me and Katie had to talk about that one subject that I said, this is not the moment. And I'm thinking, shut up, because the Bible says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And, slow to and I even told Katie, honey, Let's move this subject to another moment. And I should be quiet in that moment. Do you agree with me after I said that? But I didn't. I said, let's just talk about this is the sore, this is one of the biggest challenges. It is the biggest challenge I have right now. I see it like the biggest challenge. And, and, and it's Sunday, and I have to be like all, like, you know, positive. And I don't want to be fighting with you. I don't want to be arguing with you. I don't want to be all messed up. And so I said, let's not talk about it. But then I start talking and talking and talking and talking. And so much. And then when I'm barely breathing in like that, and I give her a second, of, and she said, didn't you just say let's not talk about it? But I had to say my two cents, especially because I can see that, again, I am not going to win this one. <laughs> and she's going to win again. So it's so hard for me. So many path decisions every day. Dealing with finances. The Bible says, give to God what belongs to him. Amen. I see Christians struggling with the, with the finances. And I say, are you giving to God? Are you putting God first? Are you dealing with other people's convictions and priority? You have to listen to the heart. Is Jesus their identity and everything? I, I try to learn that in my conflicts with other Christians who have different convictions. And I'm thinking, no, brother, you're so wrong because my dad teach me what I'm thinking. But then I have to stop and say, is their identity in Jesus? Are they really trying to please Jesus? And they have some scripture, they can bring it up and all that stuff. And we can argue and fight all about it. But when it comes to conviction, don't let the enemy put a wedge in your godly relationship. Are you following me here? Or you'll find yourself, ah, eh, 
L-O-N-E. I'm learning to spell in English. I hope I said that right. Alone. Dealing with grown-up kids. Trust in the Lord and not in your own understanding. Acknowledge, acknowledge him in all your, and he will direct your. So many of us could save ourselves from some big problems, some big fights and arguments if we would just learn. I'm trying to learn to trust in the Lord. The last two weeks I went through something or last 10 days or something like that. I went through something and God says, Sh shut up, be quiet, you know. Trust in me, trust in me. No, God, I'm the pastor. I got to fix this and I got to fix it fast. And I don't care if I make a mess. I'm going to say something about it. And I just, for the first time in my life maybe, I stay quiet. And let me tell you, God is doing an amazing miracle in this situation. Trust in the Lord and not in your own little brain understanding. Acknowledge him. Put him in all your way. Acknowledge him. Put him as a priority and identity in your life. And he will direct your not 99%, not 80%. A hundred percent. Many of us have to take that gossip path. You're dealing with your schedule. It's loving God first and then loving people. That's what the Bible says. I like to bring this Bible for a lot of reasons. This is my dad's first Bible. He got this when he was 14 years old. A good friend of him, Hans Becker, my dad's name. He's Hans the second, not the first. This word. This word. Are you dealing with your schedule? This word says love God first and then love people. Are you dealing with your schedule? That's a path. You all have to face that path every day, every minute, every hour. Amen. <laughs> That's a path. The Bible says in your spot of schedule in your life, first is what? My relationship with who? You think we have church on Sunday because it's just Chick-fil-A doesn't open? No. We have church on Sunday because it's the first day of the week. And we come in the morning. And we talk about mission the first day of the week. We talk about finances the third. And we talk, but, but we talk about early in the morning, there is a schedule that you have established already in your life. For some people, is good morning, America. I say the word of God says, establish your path in good morning, God. But when dealing with my schedule, you know what I find myself? And I have to deal with this constantly. I like to schedule my life to serve myself. Anybody here? I like to do this, and I like to do this, and I have to do this, and I have honey. You know, I have to. I have to, Katie. I have to. I'm a pastor, and I have to do this, and I have, and, but and I have to look at it. That's what I have to do. And many of us will be better off in scheduling our schedule path if we will put God first and others after that. Because I can bet you there is many in this room who schedule their life to serve themselves. No amen on that. When it comes to working with others, being married, being a father, I find that many of us have a path of controlling and not cooperating. That's a spirit. 
That's an attitude. That's a decision. That's a priority in my life. You want to have healthy relationship? You want to stay in this church serving for many decades? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because you're going to say, well, pastor is going really crazy now. But let me tell you something. You want to stay in healthy relationships. Did you want to work for a long time? You want to be the boss and see your company grow. Listen, you want to see your company grow. You can have the spirit of cooperation or you can have the spirit of controlling. You want to stay in the same church. You want to stay in the same healthy, good relationships. There is people in the path of this area of their lives. They, instead of having a spirit of cooperation, they have a spirit of controlling. Look at somebody in the eyes. Let's make it real. What is the spirit of, that you have in your relationship? Is it a spirit of cooperating? How can I help? Ooh, it got really warm in the room all of a sudden. Huh? How many marriages don't even want to look at the other? You're going to get it later, honey. I'm going to tell you, you look at me and everybody in the church saw that you were just saying with your eyes, you are a controlling wife, you know. <laughs> we laugh here, but you know what I'm talking about? Jesus which would be my example and your example, he says, not my will, but the will of my Father. How can I help, Father, for this plan of your, of saving people and taking them to heaven? How can I help in that plan? And the Father says, you got to die on the cross. Sooner or later, you'll face that decision. Do you have an area in your life, a path that is full of tension? Most likely, most likely, most likely, you're not living by the word of God in that area. You will be blessed or cursed in every part of your life, and it depends on obeying what the word says. The Lord will bless you and protect you, or the devil will steal from you and destroy you. How many of you guys who are Christians, and you were a Christian, you were going to heaven. You found yourself in an area of your life, a part of your life, being a Christian, that you were not doing what the Bible says about it. Can I see your hand? We'll get into that. The paths. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. You can be going to heaven and really struggling. Proverbs 3, like I said, he says, I will lead you in the paths. David says to God in a scripture that I was reading this week, Lord, straight up my crooked paths. He's still walking with God. He's still a great king. He's still going to heaven. And he finds himself in crooked paths. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter, verse, chapter 2 and verse 3. So there is only one way of wisdom, the Bible and God. But then we make all these path decisions. And I cannot talk about every path. You know many of the paths in your life. And I was praying this week, as you look for 1 Kings 2, 3, I was praying this week that God will reveal, will reveal to us this week, this Sunday, this week coming up, paths that we are in that we don't even know that we are in. Sometimes people tell me stuff, and I'm thinking, you're crazy, and God is trying to use them. I'm not saying you're crazy, but I'm thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> a few months ago, I told a person that is not sitting in this church, 
be careful because we all struggle with pride. And you know what this person, I almost said the gender. Whew, I'll get in trouble if I say the gender probably. Now you know there was a woman. <laughs> and I told this lady, be careful with pride. And she told me, I am the most humble person that I know, Pastor. <laughs> no, and you laugh because it sounds like a joke for you. But not for her. She was very, very serious about it. And I know this woman. She loves to talk about how wonderful she is. And all that she does. And all that she did. And all that she's going to do. And how wonderful her family is. And how wonderful her marriage is. And how wonderful the ministry is. And how amazing she is. And how she looks down on other people who are not like her. And some people are looking, are you joking? No, I'm not. She told me, I'm the most humble person that I know, Pastor. I do not have a problem with pride. <sighs> Blind spot. You know what that means? You'll kill. There is thousands of people pushing up daisies. I love that phrase. I love that phrase. You know what that means, no? We say in Argentina, look at how the grass grows from the bottom. There's thousands of people pushing up daisies who were killed because they did not turn their neck a little bit more than looking at that little mirror in the car. You know what I'm talking about. They couldn't turn the neck. They were so convinced of their own truth that they couldn't turn the neck. I almost killed my family several years ago. The whole family in an old little grand caravan who nothing worked here, but I had to put gas all the time. I didn't know it was gas. It was a mess of a van. I almost killed my whole family because I did not turn my neck and a semi-truck came here and he honked and I swing and everybody's like, ah, in the van. Blind spots. And I pray this week, Lord, when I preach this word, will you reveal to us blind spots? I have so much fear. I get so nervous. I get so crazy. I am so, uh, I don't know. First Kings 2, 3, the third point. What is the testimony of others about you? And keep the charge of the Lord your God. To walk where? In his ways. To keep what? His, what? His statutes. His commandments. And then it comes, after he said three times, ways, statutes, and commandments, now talks about what? His judgments. That's a path in my life that I have been not be obedient to God, and God is going to come and judge me, not to send me to hell, but to judge me in the area of my life. So I wake up finally. Anybody been there? His judgment, and then it says, His testimonies are is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in 90% of what you do. What does it say? In how many areas? In all that you do, and like we don't, did not understand that we're reading the Bible too fast because I have to read a scripture every morning, and God is going to say again, in all you do, and whatever you turn. I walk out of this place, I'm going to turn that corner, and somebody's going to tell me, the coffee sucks in this church. It's bad when you make the coffee and it sucks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it didn't suck for anybody, just for you. You know what I'm saying? That's a path that I have to face now. And the Bible says that when you are living his ways, his commandments, his statutes, 
Here's law. You will prosper in how many parts? In how many parts? Struggling with your mind, that's a path. Struggling with your son, struggling with your daughter, struggling with your mother-in-law, struggling with your finances, struggling with fear, struggling with desperation, struggling with pain, struggling with unforgiveness, struggling with all these crazy things that we struggle. The Bible says. So, question. In what path of your life you're not prospering? Because the Bible says that if you are doing in the, the, all his way, all his commandments, you're going to prosper in how many? All. all. Honey, I have, I have good news for you. Being a Christian is the most wonderful thing in the world. If you read the word every day and you let the Holy Spirit speak to you about every path. Yes or no? And let's go deeper. Let's go uh, to Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. Thus says the Lord. Stand in the ways. How many ways? Two ways. Stay in the ways and see and ask for what? For what? This part, this word is old, my friends. Thousands and thousands of years old. And ask God, not me, go to your closet, to, go to your time with God, go with the Bible, and ask God for the old paths where the good way, the way, not many ways, now the good way. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Many ways on the top, the life and death, the Bible, not the Bible, your flesh, or, or, or the Holy Spirit, my identity and whatever, or God, where the good way is, and walk in it, then you will find, what is it? Rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Give me another pill for my problem. If I leave this crazy wife, if my kids all change, if I would finally have a pastor who knows what he's doing, I don't know what it is. If my boss will give me the raise that I deserve. No, nah. the Bible says, where is the solution? I stop and I say, am I the right way? Yes, I'm going to heaven. Now, Lord, show me your paths, the old paths in the good way, and you will find rest for your soul. So the second question, the first one was, you will prosper in all your ways. So in what area are you not prospering? So the second question is easy. In what area of my life I don't have rest for my soul? I had to make the same mistake over and 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 over. And there was a path that the Lord showed me a few days ago. And he said to me, you've done your way and your path and your wisdom for 30 or 40 or 50 years. Let me show you my path. And let me tell you, and I'm just being so honest with you. In that path, this was the key. No rest for my soul. Was it horribly sinful that it was to disqualify me to be a pastor? No. Was it maybe related to having a controlling issue? An anger issue? No a cooperating issue? Maybe that was the problem. And I thank God that finally, this knucklehead got it. I hope I got it. Prosperity, but rest for your soul, is promised in the word of God. And God never lies because he loves you. He will not lie to you. 
I believe there are more than one person in this room that can relate to this word. But they said, we will not walk in it. Every time I don't like something, every time I'm tempted, every time somebody does this, every time I get mad, I will do whatever I want. Are you following me here? No rest for your soul, God says. No rest for your soul. No rest for your soul. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man and a woman, but its end is the way of death. Would you close your eyes right there where you are this morning? Big question. In what area are you not prospering? It's probably the same area that you're not finding rest for your soul. You justify it. You blame others. You run. You go to another relationship. You go to another church. You keep doing it. You keep blaming others. You keep, like me, blaming your wife for too many years until finally God has to come and knock on your door in a horrible way. Blaming your kids. Blaming other people because if people will do this and people will be more like that and people will do this. And God says, you will not find rest of your soul if others change. You will find rest of your soul if you start doing in that path what I say in my way, my word. And if you're here this morning and you say, I need rest for my soul, let me tell you, there is no identity out of Jesus who will give you not only salvation, eternal life in heaven forever, but there is no identity in this world that will give you the peace and the joy that only Christ can give you. I'm born like that, Pastor Manny. All of us were born into a horrible mess of our flesh. We all need to deny to our flesh and say, Jesus, what do you say in your word? Lord, we thank you for this church of people who is hungry for your word, God. They're hungry. They're hungry for peace. They're hungry for joy. They're hungry for prosperity and more than the financial one, but the important one the spiritual one, the soul one, the mind one, the emotional one. And if that's you this morning and you say, I need to come into the way of Jesus, I've been walking too long into the way of my own thinking, I want to lead you. This is the best and greatest decision you can ever make for your life. Surrender your life to Jesus. I'll lead you in a prayer and say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. If you're real, show yourself. If this, all these millions of Christians around the world are not crazy and they really have experienced you, I want the same that they have, Jesus. Come into my life, Lord, and make me a new person. And Lord, I pray also this morning for everybody, Lord, especially myself. Rest of our soul, prosperity being led by your Holy Spirit, being led by your word, or being led by my born flesh, sinful center in my self nature. Lord, I ask you for those who struggle in their minds constantly. I ask you for those that struggle in their emotions, in their relationships, in their, with their mouth, with anger, slander, gossip, immorality, addiction, sin, vengeance, pride, bitterness, unforgiveness, whatever it is, Lord. Lord, would you please lead us, Holy Spirit, this week to spend a great time of our day in your word until you show us, Lord, the path the 
path of wisdom, the path of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our church, and thank you for bringing hunger for your word and your presence, Jesus. Help us to grow and not to stay spiritually immature. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great week. God bless you. Check, check.
Check, check.